everyone to the, the second in the o Otago Energy Research Center uh, seminar series on COVID-19 disruption and energy futures. Um, so the way this, this seminar series works is we've uh, invited a range of speakers from across the energy system to reflect on any lessons from, from our pandemic experience and what that might mean to uh, help us accelerate to a, a zero carbon energy uh, energy future in New Zealand. Um, just a couple of housekeeping things before we get going. Uh, ask you all to keep your microphones muted. Um, and the idea is that uh, we'll have a 20 minute presentation roughly, and then we'll open it up to, to questions and conversations uh, amongst all the participants. So when we get to that point, if you can just flag in the chat box that you have a, a question or a comment, you can either type it there or just, just indicate that you, you want to say something and I'll, uh, I'll invite you to, uh, to engage in that way. Um, and this is a series that we are hoping to run every two weeks. And so the next uh, speaker will likely be the, around the 1st of July. Um, we haven't uh, confirmed that person yet, or they haven't confirmed back with us, but uh, pay attention to your, your emails and we will, we will advertise that. Uh, so with that, it gives me a great pleasure to, uh, to welcome and introduce Eric Pyle as our speaker today. Um, Eric is the um, Director of Public Affairs and Policy at Solar City, and so he's well placed at the interface of uh, from industry in conversations about uh, sort of energy futures and, and transitions, and so we're we're very pleased that he's uh, agreed and taken the time to to speak with us today. Um, Eric, I'll pass it off to you. <clears throat> thank you very much, Sean, and, and um, kia ora, everybody, and thank you uh, very much for inviting me to um, to really reflect on um, COVID nineteen, uh, the impacts that it's uh, having could have in the future. Um, it certainly is a, a once in a hundred year event that, that none of us have really ever lived through, of course. So I really want to start um, with the view from my house. I live in Plymouth and Wellington, and, and, and this is one of the five good days a year that we have in Wellington. Um, and the, we, we obviously, as you can see, have a tremendous view. And we moved here about 20 years ago. And I don't know if you can see my mouse, but uh, on the left side of the screen is about 100 kilometres of um, uh, to, to Marlborough. To the, to the hills behind, uh, between the Arbitrary Valley and, and, the, and the Marlborough Valley. And um, going off into the distance is, is the ranges, is the range of sort of mountains behind Marlborough. And for those of you who have done work in say the freshwater and marine area, this is actually a tremendous visual clarity measurement instrument. Because as the hills get further away, they obviously get less clear. And the point at which they disappear is a very, very fine, and definable sort of um, observation um, that is easily um, done, in, as I said, with the Seshi disc in, uh, in the marine environment and um, in, in lakes and the black disc and rivers. When we moved in 20 years ago, we could see round to about here. The, the clarity slowly declined over time, and I asked Niwa, well, why is this? And they said, oh, Eric, you're getting older, you need glasses, of course. Um, and I said, no, it's not like that, because I know that this is, a, is an actual measurement device. And they really sort of puzzled, and they said, well, it could be global uh, pollution. Um, because uh, in the Antarctic ice cores, of course, you can see where the, the impact of the Clean Air Act in the US in terms of a change in the colour of the ice. Um, the clarity in the last few years has started to improve. But during COVID-19, there was a massive improvement. If you can see over on the right hand side there, we're seeing mountains, the tops of mountains that are well over the horizon and the tops are just sticking out at about 180k distance. Um, we've never seen that before. So the point about this is that COVID-19 has actually changed atmospheric chemistry, it's changed atmospheric clarity, it's changed the way humans, the human economy works and impacts on the environment. And my uh, proposition is that the effects of COVID could be quite long lasting given the, given the huge changes that it's had. What I'm going to cover in this presentation, I'm going to talk about Solar City and our technology, introduce us and, and who we are and what we do. 
I'm going to just touch on some observations about the global energy situation, in part picking up on some work that or some, some of the mentions that Janet uh, Stevenson did um, a couple of weeks ago around coal. Talk about some of the impacts that we see as a business um, and other businesses as well, and in terms of are we going to change our work habits a bit? And if we are, what are the implications for the power system? And I'm going to finish off with uh, possibly some provocative comments about uh, innovation in the economy, drawing on uh, one of my um, old lecturers, uh, the late Sir Paul Callaghan. Uh, and, and for Michael Jack and others in the room, I've got a physics background as my first degree. So a little bit about Solar City. Um, what's our mission? Our mission is to accelerate New Zealand's transition to be 100% renewable and to lower the cost of energy for Kiwis. That's really important to us. Um, you know, Pre-COVID, of course, um, there was some reasonable competition for um, skilled workers in New Zealand, and our mission was really important as a business. It helped, it brings people into the business. It's one of the reasons I work for Solar City, um, is the mission of the business. And this is a, a quote from our, from our founder, Andy Booth. He said, let's be the generation that tackles climate change. Let's tackle it head on. Let's be the generation that says right here, right now, let's get to 100% renewable faster than any other nation. We can do that. We're so renewable. We're 80 something percent renewable. Let's, let's get to 100. That's the vision that, that Andy has for the business. And it's, it's sort of inspired people like me to, to come and work for Silver City. So what do we provide? <clears throat> this is the solar energy service, the solar zero energy service as we call it. Solar panels, we provide a battery system. Uh, we provide price protection. So we guarantee that um, our customers will always pay uh, less for our, our service than they would in terms of grid electricity. Um, and we provide some really great stuff in terms of smarts. And I'll just get onto this slide here because that really shows um, more the technology angle of what we're about. Yes, we're about solar panels. Of course, it's, it's in our title. But um, also we're about real smarts. We've got, um, for every, with every solar system, we install a battery as well. But importantly, we install a really smart device in the battery and that lives, it's a tiny little black box that lives between the two main switch boxes there. That's a smart controller um, that controls the battery um, and in time, as people get more and more appliances with Wi-Fi ability, like fridges and um, heat pumps and all the rest of it, it will start to control more and more of the, the appliances in the house. And it will see the battery as yet another appliance to manage in terms of contribution to the power system, optimizing household energy use, and optimizing, um, optimizing value really in terms of creating a better power system for New Zealand. All of that of course is data driven um, and analytics. Um, and this um, little device in here has a reasonable amount of that, but the heavy lifting in terms of analytics is of course done in the cloud with this device here getting the instruction set from the cloud on what to do for that particular household and that particular network and that particular grid exit point. And of course, with all of that comes monitoring and interactives and people can see what's going on. And of course, we can um, understand what's happening in the, in the systems as well. Um, our customers pay a monthly fee, um, let's sign a 20 year agreement, and we walk alongside our customers as a partnership um, really into the future to create a better power system for New Zealand. So what do our customers get? Um, they, get a, they get cleaner, cheaper, smarter um, ways to power their home. As I said, we guarantee savings. Um, and also this partnership for, with us for 20 years where we look after sys, uh, software upgrades, we look after system upgrades, uh, we replace the battery when the battery needs replacing and so on. Um, and we fixed up to 80% of our power bills in real terms. So 80% of people's uh, power does not increase with inflation. And these are on the right here are some comments. Um, I'd always wanted to utilize solar power, but it's not until integrated solar um, became a bit like so, uh, this uh, became solutions became available um, and decided the time was right for me. What I love about Solar Zero, it's an all in one service um, that ties all these great products into the home. To summarize those quotes, and what we found, we've got about 4,000 um, customers out there, we've got now over 3,000 uh, batteries in home. So, 
we operate by global standards, a fairly significant virtual power plant. And in terms of the size of the power system, this is, this is absolutely up there in terms of the sizes of this virtual power plant that we operate when we aggregate all our batteries and, and get them operating in, in unison. But um, one of the um, originators of the company, Sir Stephen Tyndall, said, look, I want, I want someone to come up with a model and a mechanism that enables average New Zealanders, middle New Zealand, to get access to this clean technology. And so the graph here on the, on the lower left, the blue line represents um, one of our early uh, uh, products, uh, which was really cash, so, uh, solar systems for cash. And you can see this is using the deprivation index, which is of course an Otago University piece of work. Um, it was the wealthier people, uh, deep index one, who um, adopted, who, who were the most common adopters of our systems and we saw a lesser adoption in the less well-off areas. When we introduced what's called our Solar Zero product, that's zero dollars down and just a monthly fee, we saw quite a significant change. We saw the people of South Auckland getting access to solar and batteries. We saw the people of Flaxmere and Hastings getting access to solar and batteries. And you can see across the deciles here um, that it's pretty flat. So we're seeing even uptake across the deciles, which from our perspective is absolutely great. And again, just a reminder, decile 10 is the, the reverse to the um, decile uh, 10 for schools. <clears throat> um, you've heard me talk a lot about batteries so far. They're, we see them absolutely critical to the future of the power system and, and have a whole heap of benefits. And one of the questions we commonly get asked is, so where are all these uh, batteries gonna come from? Um, and part of the answer is from our vehicle fleet. At um, about 0.5% of the uh, fleet that's electrified currently, um, that's somewhere in the order of 10,000 tonnes of lithium iron uh, lurking around on the roads of New Zealand, which is enough lithium iron to put um, a good sized battery into people's homes when, when they become a bit tired in the car, off they go to people's houses and, and at 0.5% of the fleet, if those batteries were taken out, which they will be eventually, um, and hopefully put into people's homes, that's about 70,000 homes. So there's going to be an enormous supply of lithium iron coming out of, um, out of the transport industry for some considerable period. <clears throat> and I say that as an EV owner, thinking that in five or maybe seven years I'll look at changing the, uh, the battery in my EV. Um, I'll now move to the impacts of COVID and the implications for the power system. Janet, a couple of weeks ago, commented about coal and, you know, answering the question, why is the air cleaner? Why is the view from my house gone from sort of 120, 130 k's to around the 180 k mark? Um, and the answer is coal. And who would have believed this sort of 10 or 15 years ago that coal would be a marginal producer and that when things got tough, one of the first things that went is coal. Coal, as we know globally, is in decline, coal generation, because renewables are cheaper. Simple as that. Um, and that's a quote that was in the BBC. Our coal-based power plants are operating at less than 60% of capacity. They can't pay back the money they've been lent. And that's from, um, that's from India, which is a heavy coal nation, and rapidly and you know, reasonably rapidly changing. But this, again, is from the BBC. It's a, um, the black line is a coal used in 2020. Um, it dipped right down, and you can see in there quite a substantial difference due to COVID. And I suspect that's one of the reasons that we're seeing clear air here in Plymouth in New Zealand as a consequence of this. Unfortunately, it's sort of caught up a little bit. Um, we'd like to see that dip down even further over time. So are we going to see, as a consequence of COVID, a change in, in, um, in workplace practice? One of the comments that we've got from staff in Solar City was, actually, I can get quite a lot done at home. Um, I'm not stuck in Auckland traffic for ages. I'm much more productive. Um, I'm actually quite enjoying it. And Google Hangouts and Zoom and, and uh, Microsoft meet, uh, Teams and all the rest of it is actually pretty good. Um, I would have to say that, um, you know, we can't whiteboard. It's hard to sort of get face to face and so on. Um, but we can, we have discovered that the internet has got to the point where video conferencing is actually pretty good. And so this is an article from the Guardian, sorry. Um, so long New York, 
pandemic and protest sparks, sparks exodus to the suburbs. Are we going to see people giving up on their inner city living? Are we going to see them moving into the suburbs because they only have to come into the office every few days? At Solar City, we've taken the opportunity. We've said, actually, do we need a desk for everybody? And we've said, no, we don't. So we're going giving people more space. We're sort of hot desking the whole business. And other businesses that we're talking to are thinking about doing, doing similar things. Um, and, and that's really exciting because it gives people flexibility. <clears throat> this is from Utility Dive that some of you may read. It's a, it's a US publication, pretty similar to Energy News. Um, and they're saying that our CEOs in the US are looking at teleworking uh, because their, their employees are discovering the benefits. Um, we've been through an unintentional exploration uh, experiment and actually there's some upsides from, from what we've learned. How do we capture those upsides and maintain those and, and increase people's enjoyment of work and, and, and workplace productivity? Um, and in New York, the, uh, the public utility there has actually started to gear up um, significantly for this sort of working away from home, thinking that, yeah, actually it, it has worked. That people are happier. Our employees are telling us that they want this greater flexibility. Um, this here was an article in the, in the Dom Post, um, Dominion Post in Wellington, um, just on the weekend. <clears throat> um, New Zealanders are looking at a fourth bedroom. Why? Not to have a bed in it, of course, but to turn it into an office so that they can actually do that working from home thing and having to go into Wellington uh, less, you know, less often uh, to go to the office. So what did we see in terms of Excuse me. What do we see in terms of um, energy use in New Zealand during the lockdown? And, and some of this information has been uh, provided by our good friends at Ecotricity. Um, firstly, obviously, commercial industrial um, energy was reduced significantly um, as these businesses shut down. Um, normal work practices, yes, they got disrupted. But gosh, a lot of people said, actually, this working from home lark, it's actually pretty good. I'm getting a lot done. <clears throat> Why don't we do this all the time and have this flexibility? Will that result in companies um, renting smaller offices? But what has that done to residential use? And I understand that um, during the lockdown, residential use did increase, um, some say uh, potentially significantly by you know, more than 10%. And another observation is, of course, that EV use decreased. Now, whether that will increase again following um, you know, the, the level one, who knows, that time will tell. But I think what we can say is that we are going to see an increase in residential household energy use um, and whether we see changes in, in the use of EVs or not and cars in general, I'm not sure. So working from home, what are some of the implications for the power system, assuming that we're going to see more working from home? We're going to have to look at power system reliability. Um, people are going to use more power during, during the day. That actually suits solar. Um, are we going to see a change in use of energy communities? Are we going to see more sort of rural suburban uh, cafes that people go to to sort of have their meetings there and so on? Are we even going to see people, uh, as is being suggested in New York, move out of apartments and into suburbia? Does that mean that we're going to see more houses in suburbia um, trying to access the existing electricity infrastructure? And as Janet pointed out a couple of weeks ago, having people from home uh, work from home in the winter Got to raise questions about whether that's um, great from a health perspective um, if they're not heating their homes effectively because the homes are, are poorly insulated. So that's some of the things that I'll, I'll now explore. <clears throat> and this is uh, from from our perspective, of course, solar and batteries when the lights in our in our case don't go out. Now this is an article in the Herald, and and some of you may remember that Victor actually had a reasonable amount of maintenance planned and, and was still continuing to do some of this arguing that it was an essential service, which of course the power system is. But in the end, under public pressure, they had to um, halt the planned outages because so many people were working from home. And this is a, a headline from the New Zealand Herald in, in um, late March. One of the um, things that our battery does is it islands the house um, during power outages. And these are just some comments from um, some of our customers. On Tuesday morning, the power went off due to a tree further up the road. No big deal, made little difference to us as the lights we needed worked along with our TV. Another one, once more the power went out in our area last night, but we continued to cook dinner, watch movies, make a cup, and no disruption to our life whatsoever. And I think it's going to be important that um, when people are working from home, 
that there aren't these power disruptions that, um, that really cause quite a kerfuffle um, in Auckland. Um, one th our batteries um, are enormously programmable, as I've said. They're, they're basically, you know, it's a, it's a software game. And um, this is what we do to household electricity demand um, during the day. Now, the, the orange line is, again, some Otago data from the Green Grid project that I think Janet and Janet Stevenson and her crew prepared. And that's for a typical average household, and an average household is, is, uh, has been collected across a number of households, and when you um, add up all the numbers, that's what the daily profile looks like. That starts at midnight, finishes at midnight, and for those of you who are not in the electricity uh, industry, the electricity lives and breathes a 48 time step day every half hour. Um, the blue line is aggregated across our fleet of, um, of households with solar and batteries. We actually introduce a new peak um, at about two or three in the morning. Um, we significantly reduce the morning peak and we significantly reduce the evening peak. And we can play with with this profile, we can adjust our batteries to do different things. So if people work from home more and, and uh, create a peak at different times, we can adjust for that to ensure that the power system um, operates smoothly and is not overloaded by changes to um, household electricity demand. And there's a lot of space in our power system. There's a lot of ways that we can do things quite differently and get a lot more into our existing power system if we're really smart about it. This is Christchurch, and this was a, a, a day when uh, Christchurch was using, uh, Orion was using load control in Christchurch, mainly hot water, because they're worried about the peak. Um, but even on a busy day from an electricity perspective, there was enough room on the Christchurch power system to charge 300,000 electric vehicles, if we're smart about when we're charging them. So there's a lot of, a lot of room for shifting load in the power system and with solar and batteries and, and smart control on EV charging and so on we've now got the technology that really enable us to do that. Um, also what happens if people start moving moving out of cities and into suburbia and you know, we're seeing this, this happen in a few few parts of New Zealand we're seeing densification with some of the very big projects that Kainga Ora are doing in the lakes of Porirua East near Wellington and in large parts of um, Auckland. Um, and the two blue lines here are um, there's a subdivision, um, a, a standard subdivision that we've got our data from. This is a lot more houses and what the, what the profile would look like. And then we said, well, what if we got a significant proportion of the new houses to adopt our solar and battery system? And we estimate that if we, if we get enough houses with these systems, you can actually start to double the number of houses that you can fit into the existing electricity system without having to invest in new wires, new poles and new transformers. So if we do start to see a change in uh, people's behaviour, working from home more or even densification as a consequence of COVID long term, when people say, no, actually, I really do want to work from home, um, then I actually think that with, with solar batteries and smart control, we can actually handle that very well in the power system. Finally, I'm just going to throw a few provocative thoughts on the table about um, innovation. Um, this is a quote from Sir Paul Callaghan, and I'm not sure how many of you have been uh, actually sat through one of his presentations in person about the sort of future of New Zealand, innovation, innovative companies, and so on. They were, I, I had the pleasure, the absolute pleasure of sitting through his presentation a couple of times. And what a man of passion, what a man of vision in terms of what he was talking about. And he did some fabulous research with um, Business New Zealand. Um, and one of his conclusions, and, and he said it, and I remember when he said it, he said, every tourist we get in New Zealand makes us poorer. And of course, everyone in the audience sort of immediately sort of um, recoiled at that sort of thought because tourism is seen as such a big industry for New Zealand. Um, but in this written stuff, he says, the more tourism we have, the poorer we get. Tourism is not a route to, to prosperity. And I sort of thought about that, and he provided all the analysis about the number of jobs and, and all the rest of it. And he, he had another great statement, which was, we're poor because we want to be poor. And, and what does that mean? And, and um, in my last role, which was with the Walking Access Commission, I got to sort of spend a little bit of time with high-performance sport, of all people. And I had an interesting insight there. 
New Zealand has won about 24 gold medals per million people over the time of the Olympics. Vietnam is 0 0.05 Olympic medals per million people, and Japan is about 3.5 per million. The number of Olympic medals we, we win, I would say, I, I would postulate, it's not a question of us being really good at sports. It's a question of public policy. It's a question of our investment because Sport New Zealand said that for every $10 million we invest extra, chances are we'll get another medal. So the point is, and Sir Paul's point was, how do we get that sort of push to support innovative companies which can grow wealth in New, in, in New Zealand and help with, you know, grow exports and all of that sort of stuff? Um, how do we get New Zealanders to care more about innovation? That was his passion about creating a, a a New Zealand where talented talent want to come and live. You know, how do we how do we sort of encourage a debate about um, winning the gold medal for becoming the first carbon zero nation and, and all the supporting um, infrastructure and companies and export opportunities that, that, that we can create around that? And electricity is absolutely critical to that to that future because if we decarbonize our, our economy, we're actually going to increase the use of electricity significantly. Unfortunately, the electricity industry currently, according to Callaghan Innovation, is the second least innovative industry in New Zealand, a smidgen above innovation in the building industry. So what do we need to do in terms of my final slide here? One of the things that, critical things that we need to do in, in terms of electricity sector and to help with the, the decarbonisation of the economy is get much quicker at changing the rules. The electricity um, industry is a very rules-based industry and it must be, it has to be, it's public safety. Electricity is really, really dangerous stuff if we get it wrong. So we have to get it absolutely right. And if we start to put um, equipment on the power system that doesn't work properly, the lights can go out and that can be an absolute disaster. So we want to avoid that. But when I look overseas at the likes of an electricity system called PJM, that's the largest on the planet. It uses the same software as was developed in the, uh, on the terrace in Wellington to, to run the power system. They put rules in, in place to have batteries onto their power system to support frequency keeping and ancillary services. They did the rule change in two months. Here we take years, and yet we're a much smaller country. We all know each other. We can all get the key people in the room and make decisions. Yet for some reason, PJM, 17 states and all the politics, District of Columbia, 180 gigawatt system, they managed to put these rule changes in, in two months. Part of what I think we need too is a clear agenda for change and, and evolution. And I don't know if Scott Willis is on the call, but he's a member of a group called IPAG, run by the Electricity Authority, the Innovation Participation Advisory Group. It has come up with a fantastic agenda, um, and it did, did, has done that over the last sort of two years. Um, and as far as I know, it hasn't really got legs. It hasn't got up, and yet it's a great piece of work, some great ideas. And I think all of us interested in innovation and, and energy and moving to a low carbon future need to have a look at that kind of work and ask ourselves, how can we actually expose that work to the rest of New Zealand? How can we get people in the electricity industry really excited about, about the agenda that's, that's come out of the likes of the IPAG? I think too, we need some new metrics around performance. Um, should we be judging lines companies or assessing lines companies on the difference between the peak use and the, and the low time in the electricity network, the sort of five o'clock in the evening on a winter's night or three o'clock in the morning? Because the closer we can match those two and get a flat demand across 24-7 and across the year, the more efficient the power system, the more productive uh, the use of capital in the, in the power system, the benefits that all of us as New Zealanders get from a, from a more efficient power system. I think the likes of universities and so on have a, a tremendous role to play. Um, we, we had the pleasure of a guy called Ben Anderson come over um, through Otago University and share some of the thinking from, um, from the UK as to what's going on there. I think we need to do more of that. You know, we've had tremendous periods of innovation in the New Zealand power system, um, almost supernova-like with the development of the HVDC link um, and the, uh, the wholesale market and so on. How do we recapture some of that innovation? How do we learn and draw in the best um, from other countries, mix it up with our sort of Kiwi can-do attitude and create a, a, a sort of set of innovation in the power system again, which can hopefully get us to 100% and live to Paul Callaghan's sort of vision for New Zealand creating these smart entrepreneurial companies. 
And finally, I'd say too, greater support, and I hope I'm not sounding too self-interested here, but greater support for innovative companies, and, and we would class ourselves in that, through Callahan Innovation and, and other support networks as well, um, to really help us you know, with our exports, looking overseas, uh, with our technology and so on. And I think that's it. I've probably taken about my 20 minutes. Thank you. Oh, thanks very much, Eric. Um, certainly lots to, to think about there. Uh, I'd like to, to open it up to, to questions and, and comments from, from the audience now. If you, you have a question uh, or comment, um, you let me know through the, the chat chat box and I'll, I'll get you to, uh, to unmute yourself and, and uh, say what you have to say. I've uh, Alex, uh, so <laughs> takes people a, a while to uh, to get into it. Uh, Alex has a, a question. Alex, do you want to uh, go ahead? Oh, you've unmuted me. Thank you. Uh, <laughs> you <sorry. laughs> Sorry, I was trying to unmute myself. Thanks, Eric. That was fascinating. And it's really great to see. I was most, I'm a public health person interested in climate justice and public health. And um, it was great to see that graph around deprivation and the deprivation. Um, I'm interested in your, um, you explaining what, what I'm seeing is a tension between um, the commitment to justice and providing solar to low-income households and the 20-year partnership so we know that these are highly mobile households and um and even um high-income households are very unlikely to be living in their houses for 20 years at a time so how does this 20-year partnership work in terms of the mobility of households yeah, really good question. Thank you for that, Alex. And, um, and I, I really didn't go through my background, but I've got an environmental background originally, um, even though my first degree was physics. Um, and one of the things you learn pretty quickly in environment, uh, particularly in the 20th, 20th, 21st century, is just data mashups and pulling data from all sorts of different areas. So um, it was one of my first thoughts here with the deprivation index, which I know is developed um, from a health perspective, but of course we've we've mapped it across to our area as well, and it's it's great. Um, we're really pleased with the outcome that we've got for householders um, in terms of um, you know the, the flat line across across the thing. Um, we realise that we've got a lot of work to do to think through how to address the tenant landlord issue and and people who move through through rentals. Um, we've started a conversation with Kainga Ora um, around some of that sort of stuff. Can they play, help us play a leadership role in, in that area? And globally, that's a really hard area. But to answer your question specifically, um, when people move, um, there's a number of options um, that they've got. Um, and they can take our system with us and put it on their new house. And, and of course, we're only targeting, uh, tailoring our, our product at the moment, as I said, for the homeowner market and, mm. and the rental for us. You know, we're not ignoring it. But we're doing what we can and step by step, uh, rentals sort of on our agenda and we're scratching our heads, heads about it at the moment. So there's three options, uh, take, can take it with you, um, can leave it for the uh, next um, householder. Imagine that uh, 10 years ago, um, imagine you're buying a house now and 10 years ago the people got a solar zero system. Electricity prices have gone like that. So the, the price you're paying for your solar zero system will be substantially lower than your grid price. You're going to say, hey, that's really cool. Can I carry on with that? And then there's another option of sort of um, paying out the contracts. But um, it's those first two options that most people go for. Thank you. And my second question was about this. Um, you know, you presented this network as a kind of a... Um, a power grid, although it is just like a sum of parts at the moment. Yeah. Um, and I and I know that there are innovations in places like Bangladesh where you've got at least at community level solar hubs 
with a shared grid and I'm wondering whether that's something that you were thinking about moving towards so that you can share some of that load um, sold, you know, at a community level. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're certainly moving in that direction so that um, the factory in, in, in South Auckland with the huge roof or the warehouse can be exporting power during the weekends or whatever to the um, socially deprived community next door type thing. Um, sorry? That would be amazing. Yeah, 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 so, sort of things like that. Um, there are some real changes um, in the electricity industry that are needed to do that. There's a, a very um, a very arcane sort of uh, term, multiple traders through an ICP, uh, which is, again, the, the work of the Innovation Participation Advisory Group, or the IPAG. Um, and unfortunately, in, in any industry, once you get into it, you do get into these arcane sort of words and, and, and titles. But I think changing some of those rules are pretty essential to enabling these sorts of new technologies um, to really flourish. And, and that's where I think we, we all need to look at, you know, what are the rules? Are they appropriate for the 21st century and the kind of technologies that we've now got? Thank you. Uh, great. I think next on the list, a question from Janet or a comment from Janet. Um. I think it's them. Yeah, muted them. <laughs> Thanks, Eric. That was that was really great. Uh, very interesting to see how how it's progressing uh, with, with with Solar City and Solar Zero. Um, I'd be really interested in your comments about what are the opportunities for New Zealand, um, given the big push for building vast amounts of, of uh, new housing through Kiwi Build and through Kainga Aura's plans to. Um, extend social housing. So what opportunities do you see for solar to play a significant role in in this new push for for um, massively increasing our housing estate? Yeah, I see um, two, two roles really. I mean, clearly there's the, um, and, and this is in terms of solar zero, not just solar. Um, there's, there's the opportunity in, in providing electricity where people want to use it on, on their roof and their house. Um, and you know, electricity demand we expect could increase by 80 to 100 percent over the next um, 20, 30 years, according to Transpower and so on, with a combination of um, population growth and EVs and transport and all the rest of it. So we're going to kind of need just about every roof we can get our hands on as a as a country um, to put solar on because we're going to need so much solar and and wind is going to be needed as well. So that's the first point. How do we meet our electricity demand of the future? We try and encourage solar onto all the new housing development areas. The second thing is, well, how do we do that really cost effectively? How do we how do we build these subdivisions and ensure that we don't overbuild the electricity infrastructure? And I'm talking to Kainga Ora at the moment, who are talking with lines companies, and they're wanting to take in, in the example I'm looking at, 2,000 houses and increase it to about three and a half thousand. That's a $40 million bill for electricity infrastructure upgrade. Now, if we put our solar and batteries in there, we don't need to spend that 40 million. Now they're spending lots more than that, a billion dollars and, and so on, on on water and and all the rest of it. But still $40 million as a saving is worth doing. And with of course the batteries, you get the advantage of resilience and a whole heap of heap of other a value stack that goes with the batteries. So we're starting to have those conversations as we get more confident about our technology and what it can deliver. And we can be really confident that if we put a battery and, uh, and solar on a person's house, it so so tremendously and significantly changes the demand profile that we can be confident that we don't need to upgrade that transformer or that power line or whatever. Right, and, um, and can I can I just add a supplementary question there, which is which is really me just probing your your knowledge of what's happening globally. So. What, what's happening with, with the cost of, of solar and batteries? Um, uh, yeah, what's, what's the trajectory and, and where, where does your company see that ending up? Yeah, where, where does it end up? That's a really good question. Um, we just don't know. The, the prices continue to fall. And um, as some of you know, I used to uh, be in the wind industry and it was a very similar industry. Uh, you're in a deflationary in industry and it, it's really interesting trying to develop business models and, and, and all the rest of it. But um, I, I had, when I was in the wind industry, I had the absolute pleasure of meeting uh, the, they called him the godfather of the wind industry in a good way, not a bad way. 
um, a guy called Henrik Steesdale, who developed a 16 kilowatt turbine, a bonus turbine, and bonus got bought by Siemens. He thought his 16 kilowatt turbine was the bee's knees. He thought that was it. He'd done his life's work. It was a fabulous turbine. Um, the latest GE design uh, that they're testing, I think, is 14 megawatts. Um, and the cost of power coming out of that is dramatically less than the 16 kilowatt thing. We're in a similar situation in the solar and battery industry. Once we start taking batteries out of EVs and putting them into households, you know, the cost of batteries really starts to come down dramatically. Cost of solar is continuing to, to fall. To answer your question, where will it end up? We just don't know. Very cheap is, is the answer. Um, just a, a couple of comments from, from Marin, and I think it goes back to a, a previous comment you made around the, the issues of the, the cost of infrastru electricity infrastructure. Um, but if I can paraphrase for, for Marin, um, really questioning, should we be celebrating this, uh, this push of increasing sub suburbanization and sprawl, but also, um, I guess, can we, should we view the working from home phenomena as universally positive? Uh, how do we address the, the inequities and, and that kind of thing associated with it? I captured uh, your comments there, Marin, or do you have anything else to add? Uh, yeah, I'm unmuted now. Um, now that's sort of it. I'm thinking about longer commutes and mm -hmm. urban sprawl with suburbanization sub and in the context, context of working from home, I'm thinking about energy poverty and women's disproportional load in homework and child and elder care. Yeah, look, I, it's going to be an interesting one to see how it plays out um, in, in the working from home. I, I'm based in Wellington, I spend a reasonable amount of time in Auckland, and I sort of get the sense that the Auckland sprawl is going to continue, much as we'd like possibly as a country to sort of reduce it, but I could imagine, sometimes when I when I travel up there, I could imagine a sort of a housing estate going from Auckland and, and stopping at the Kaimais and then picking up on the other side right all the way to Tauranga. And you go, wow, how's that going to work with everybody trying to get around? Is it going to happen anyway? Because this sort of seems to be the unstoppable sort of momentum. And if it is, can we actually use things like video conferencing, working from home, to reduce the amount of time that people are doing the long commutes, encourage local sort of networks of people to meet in cafes and so on, and, and almost create a slightly different society because of our ability to do really what we're doing today? Um, I'm sort of probably not in a position to sort of comment about sort of um, people, you know, the, the whole socioeconomic aspects of, of people working from home, energy poverty. I think there is a, a challenge if people are doing that more and their en household energy use goes up and they are already in energy poverty, that's going to be tough. Um, and I think we're going to need to look at systems um, to deal with this. And I think, Janet, you picked up on this in your seminar a couple of weeks ago. Um, uh, with our poorly insulated houses here and having people working from home and the economic implications of that and the health implications. And I think I think you made the point, is now the time to really start to focus on energy efficiency um, and improving um, the housing stock in New Zealand. It's a great employer of people. And I would argue that, you know, if, particularly with our system, but with also even the, the metadata that we've got in New Zealand, we ought to be able to get some really good stats on which houses are, really, are working really well from an energy efficiency perspective, which ones aren't, um, and, and who are the people that are going to need the most help in getting their house up to um, what might be considered first world standards. I don't know if you've got a comment in relation to that, Janet. Um, if not, uh, there's been a couple of questions asking for some elaboration on uh, um, Sir Paul's comment around tourism making us poor. Uh, asking if you can elaborate what, what the rationale is there, I guess briefly. Yeah, well. yeah the uh, tourism is unfortunately, um, it, as we, you know, the very short answer is low paid jobs. Okay, and, and what he looked at is the, the amount of, um, the amount of, revenue and wealth that's created from each job 
in the tourism industry versus the wine industry, which actually surprisingly isn't much better than the tourism industry, versus Fisher and Paykel appliances versus Fisher and Paykel healthcare and the likes. And I, I, I haven't got the numbers in front of me, but I think they are of the order of sort of seven or eighty thousand per employee in the tourism industry, three hundred thousand for Fisher and Paykel healthcare in terms of the benefits for the nation. And his point was that if we invested. And we're spending hundreds of millions a year on tourism in terms of promotion and all the rest of it. He said, why don't we either shift that or sort of have a, a parallel stream where we spend similar or even more on innovation and innovative companies to try and grow the wealth base. So, And as part of that, flip the tourism a little bit on its head and, and sort of pitch New Zealand as a place where talent wants to come, where talent wants to live and set up these innovative companies. And that was the sort of vision for New Zealand. Um, I'm happy to um, explore a little further, but um, that—that that is my understanding. Um, having sat through a couple of his lectures and done a little bit of prep for this uh, this presentation. Great. Um, I guess Nathan with a, a question. Uh, I guess more around clarification. Um, basically, asking is the does the potential exist for us to or Nathan? Do you want to ask? Hi, Eric. Hi, Sean. Thanks, everyone. Uh, just wanted to clarify about your view of Sir Paul's uh, inspiring and hopeful message about what innovation could do. Uh, if we wanted to get from 83 to 85% of our electricity generation being sustainable to 100%, uh, does increased per capita electricity consumption in the future fit in? In other words, uh, are, are you suggesting that innovation can let us all consume more energy per person? Um, I mean, I think we are going to consume more per person because we're going to electrify transport. Um, and, and transport, we like getting around. I've got an EV. I love driving it. I love getting around on it. Um, and other people in this call do as well. Um, and... Actually, to run a transport fleet on, ele on electricity, you do need quite a lot of electricity, even though the electric vehicle is, is many, many, many times more efficient from an energy perspective than an internal com combustion engine. So in my view, yes, absolutely, we're going to use um, more electricity. Hopefully, we will insulate our houses better and, and use less at the household level over time and get smarter about um, using how we use electricity. I mean, I'd even like to see um, air transport electrified, either either hydrogen to, to jet fuel, which is very energy intensive, or even uh, batteries for short haul aircraft, which are being sort of um, tested. I was gonna say piloted, but I thought that was probably the wrong word. Um, tested uh, internationally. Um, great, and I think, uh sort of a comment from, from Michael, and I think it's similar to something I've been thinking of. We've just undergone this massive social experiment, uh, undergone um, massive amount of social innovation in response to a crisis. Um, and I guess, Eric, can you reflect on the potential for that to drive innovations in the electricity sector? Um, and um, are you seeing a greater uptake or interest in things like uh, your um, solar city um, in terms of people more interested in self-sufficiency, et cetera, et cetera. Um, what are some of those uh, sort of impacts in that area? Interestingly, over the lockdown, yes, we, we had higher engagement with potential customers. Um, and. And we're still sort of puzzling as, as to why that is. I think, you know, A, people had more time. B, they're working at home, thinking about electricity, thinking about um, security more um, and resilience and all of that sort of stuff, thinking about um, uh, the environment and so on more, sitting, sitting in their home with, with all of the stuff going on in the world. So, yeah, I think as people work from home more, they will say, yeah, actually, we would quite like to have solar panels and batteries for, for all the reasons that I've just outlined. Sorry, there was another part to your question and I've, I've lost that in, in my answer. Um, just, is there potential, like you talked a lot about the innovation that's required to transition the electricity sector around sort of getting, making the rules uh, more effective and more, more efficiently, et cetera, et cetera. Is there something that we can draw specifically from sort of the way we as a country were forced into doing things differently 
um, that can be used as a catalyst or a driver for some of those other other changes you've been talking about? I think at a philosophical level, um, we've probably surprised ourselves as a nation at what we could achieve collectively. I mean, I mean, even the government, I think, and when I say the government, I mean the health officials uh, rather than the politicians, are probably pretty stunned by the fact that we've managed to, apart from a couple of um, people coming in from the UK as of yesterday, um, got rid of COVID-19. Um, so, you know, part of me says, you know, can we learn from that and say, goodness me, not only can we win lots of medals at the Olympics, we can um, er uh, eradicate COVID-19, what other kind of innovations can we do? But I I'm not sure that it really takes anything like COVID. It, when, I, when I look back at the history of innovation in the power system, you know, the first long distance HVDC link, uh, 500 kilometres, the previous was 50 kilometres, and just to make it even more challenging, we'll put a whole bunch of it under, under sea through Cook Strait, some really tricky waters to, to do anything in, as one of the most vibrant sort of um, environments on the planet. Um, and we'll hook up two electrically independent power pools and, and make them work as one power pool, all in this one thing, done in the 1960s, tremendous innovation. You know, there wasn't COVID, there wasn't all of that sort of stuff. There was a bunch of people who got together who said, we've got a problem. Let's fix it. Let's let's do something really, really cool and imaginative. And they did. And same with the wholesale market when that was developed in the in the 90s. Uh, again, that was tremendous innovation in the power system. There was no sort of you know COVID type crisis to to drive that. It was a bunch of people who got together who said there's got to be a better way of doing things than what we're doing at the moment. And we kind of need that, I think, at this point to enable the kind of technology that's that's around um, globally. It's in New Zealand. We, we're we're deploying it to get our electricity industry back on its sort of hind legs, innovating again to take us forward to power the whole economy, which is what we're going to need to get to 100% renewable. Well, thanks. I think that's a, a really good point to end on. And given that we're uh, approaching the, the one o'clock uh, time, uh, just take a, take a moment to thank you once again, Eric, uh, it's been a really fantastic presentation um, with lots, lots to think about. Um, and thank you all for attending. And again, um, pay attention to your, your emails about our, our next um, seminar in a couple of weeks' time. Uh, and we'll, we'll have more information about that shortly. Oh, excellent. Thank you very much for inviting me. And um, it's always a... Um, a challenging sort of uh, thing to do to speak to a screen and not get back in any shape or form from your audience. So I think that's going to be the next sort of thing for Zoom that they somehow provide feedback to you as you.